I'll just kind of cover what I'm going to cover real quick first and then jump into it. Um, so intro is on myself. We'll get there in a second. You heard a little bit a moment ago. Uh, talk about what exactly is a RAS. If, you, if you've seen my Magna presentation from 2017, that's going to be a bit duplicated. Some of the stuff will be, most of it will not be. Um, talk about re just the general requirements for keeping them. I'll cover, this is kind of the, the bulk of this presentation, is on the, the reef safe genera in general and then in each um, genera specifically. Uh, I've got a section for mixing, talk a bit more about QT than I normally do since, you know, that's kind of the uh, point of the forum. Um, summary resource questions, all that stuff at the end. Okay, a little bit about me. Uh, I am 35, I'm an Arizona native, grew up in a little town of Prescott, which is uh, in the north half of the state, for those of you who have any clue about Arizona geography. Um, live in Phoenix now, I've been here since 08, um, after I went to school down in Tucson, so I've kind of bounced all over the state through my life, never left. Uh, I am professionally, I'm a, I'm a static structures engineer, uh, work on propulsion engines, um, so, so turbine engines and stuff that's in aircraft, um, some ground applications, APUs, helicopters, that sort of thing, static structures being all the, the non-rotating parts, the, the non-spinny bits, which is a big, big chunk of engines, but anyhow. I've um, been reef keeping for about 12 years. Yeah, that's correct. Um, my current tank is on the right there. That's not a very current photo. I should fix that in the future. Uh, but, you know, but it's still what the, the hardware of the tank looks like. Um, it's a 270 peninsula. It's six foot by three foot wide, two foot tall. Um, it's pretty much all my own creation. It's an acrylic tank that I had a, a local shop make for me. It's Titan Aquatic. Uh, the stand is my own creation with my own time and effort in it, reclaim barn wood. Anyhow, uh, last count, I made sure this is current too, there's 18 fish in there, 14 of which are wrasses. Um, if you're curious about the non ras fish, because some people are, it's, it's a pair of clowns, a tumini tang, and a uh, um, marginated coral fish, the, the Australian copper band, if you will. Uh, you, of course, probably know me as Evolved, as my alter ego in various forums through the years. I've spoken uh, at, at MACNA, Mini MACNA, uh, RAP a few years back as well. And of course, you know, the avatar I've used for well over a decade um, that you've probably seen someplace. Um, I should have a bullet point on there too. Uh, my, my husband is Matt. He is a pharmacist and uh, we've been together for 12 years also. I actually started this hobby um, about, oh, I think about a month after we were dating. Uh, and it was pretty much, you know, I didn't even know what I was getting into. And it was, uh, hey, can you come help me move this used equipment from this guy's random house? And it was, you know, as much of a job as we all know it to be, but I had no idea what I was about to venture into. All right, enough about that. Uh, okay, so what is a wrasse? Uh, the quite literal definition is, is any fish of the Libridae family. Um, Labrids is kind of the, the typical catch-all phrase. And, and I'll, I'll skip the middle school biology lesson, but uh, you know, the down here in the genus and species level um, is, is where we're really going to talk about, but the, the family is, is the, the Labrid family. Uh, so within that family, there's over 65 different uh, genera and over 460 unique species that branch down there. So it's to, to say a RAS is a, is a real big encompassing term, and uh, it, it goes from a lot of things, from these tiny guys called the, the minute RAS, that's a common name there, um, six centimeters, so that's like, you know, two, two and a half inches, all the way up to the humphead RAS, which is, you know, a, a six plus foot monster. Um, and there's a little bit of perspective going on the photo and that the you know diver is further back than than the fish there, but uh, they're big. And, and so, you know, point being, I'm only gonna be talking about a real small set of this um, today, just the ones that are reef aquarius suitable. Requirements for keeping. I hope none of this is super news to anybody here, but it's, it's good to cover fundamentals. Uh, so first and foremost, definitely the most important thing is a completely, completely covered tank. Uh, peaceful tank mates, you got to feed them several times a day, two to four. I do three myself. Um, depends on, you know, how many you have in the tank and what exactly you want to feed, but several times a day. 
uh, appropriately sized aquarium. So I kind of have some uh, blanket guidelines as to what that really means for different uh, genera, but, but we'll get there later. And um, stick to only one specimen per species. Ugh, harems, pairing, and all that is just a whole nother headache. And I've I've tried it. I've done all the things I could think to do with it, and it it never works out. And and so therefore, I don't even bother anymore. It's, it's not worth the headache. It'll work for a while, and then you end up with all males. Okay, so I'll cover each of those a bit more in some detail. Uh, so the first one is is that completely covered tank. Uh, all wrasses jump. It's not a matter of if. It's just simply a matter of when. Uh, when when they're spooked, one of the natural directions for them to go is is up, and they're not used to being in tanks that are you know the shallow that depths that we keep. A lot of these fish occur at depths of uh, of you know uh, dozens of meters. You know, so generally speaking, they have uh, a, for their purpose an infinite amount of space above them if they're darting away from somebody. Um, <sighs> I like to say this a lot. You've probably heard it. But if the head fits, the fish fits, you know, and any gap in the uh, in the tank top or edges that the head of the fish might fit through, the fish will fit through, and it's a matter of time before they seem to find it. Um, <laughs> so that's the don't leave any gaps part, and I, I know I've told the story before, but the very first wrasse I ever kept was a Labuti, and um, I, I, I distinctly remember buying it for 120 bucks. This is probably back in well, it was, it had to be 09. And uh, it was it was a little guy at the time, like half grown, maybe mm, two inches, somewhere around that mark. And I had, I had, you know, thought I had done my research well enough. I had covered the tank in egg crate, not a good idea. Uh, and the fish was literally in the tank for less than a day, uh, one night overnight. Next morning, it was on the floor, dried up, stuck to the floor. Um, and it was, you know, how did that happen? The tank's covered. Well, you know, the, the holes in the egg crate are way too big for fish that small. Um, so, so good tank covers are the clear mesh. Uh, I've kind of migrated towards the eighth inch clear mesh these days. You can get the quarter inch pretty commonly. The quarter is probably just as fine. I've never had a problem with it. Um, bulk your supply sells it. I don't know of any of the supplier who regularly has it in stock. I'd, I'd love to know if there is somebody. Um, it's really easy to make your own tank covers if you're going to use a window screen frame. Uh, there's other options out there today with some of the acrylic manufacturers. Um, there's, there's choices for that, but point being, it's easy to do and it's the fundamental essential that you've got to do first. As I already covered, a crates not a good tank cover. I wouldn't do it. Uh, glass covers or solid tank tops will work to keep the fish in, um, but if they do go to jump really, you know, hard and fast, if you will, uh, it can also um, injure that that fish torpedo, as I have it labeled there. But uh, they'll they'll smack into it at full speed, right? And and that can do physical damage to them. So that's not the best option either. Uh, I hear the last bullet point a lot and people that have like, well, I have a canopy, you know, I'm fine. It's a completely enclosed canopy, can't jump out, which may be true, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm yet to see a canopy that doesn't have other hazards in it, um, whether there be, you know, sharp edges from a light fixture or, um, you know, other things that they could cut themselves on, let alone places that they could get stuck and, and lodged. Um, there's certainly been uh, more than one story out there of someone finding a very cooked fish on top of a light fixture you know, days later. Um, so even with the canopy, you still should, you know, cover the top of the tank and just keep them in the tank and away from that stuff they don't need to be into. If you're gonna go the window screen frame, um, I this was a tank of the past for mine. Um, my, it was a DSA 190, uh, but I, I do like to do a tank top like this where it fits, you know, tight in, in the, in the, um, in the uh, tank frame if you have it. Uh, my tops today kind of sit in a groove inside the acrylic brace on the top of my tank and they're pretty heavy. Uh, so the, the point is you, you need to have them uh, fastened down in some way where they fit tight or they're you know weighted down to where if the fish does jump into them, it doesn't you know dislodge them loose. If you just throw a, a window screen essentially on top of your tank, uh, it will get knocked loose the first time someone jumps into it. And, and so with that, you know, uh, make it easy on yourself, have it easy to pull out. So I always use like the little pull tabs on the screen frames just to literally be able to grab those and pop it out of the, uh, the tank room. Next major thing was tank mates. So in the general sense, most of your common reef safe fish are pretty fine. 
the parts where you can get into trouble are in smaller tanks where you get some of the uh, other semi-aggressive fish that'll work great in smaller tanks, but not necessarily so great with wrasses, um, dotty backs, damsels, basslets, that sort of thing. In these situations, if you have someone who is a bit of a bully and they're um, forcing your asses into, into hiding or submission constantly to the point where they can't come out or where they can't eat, uh, it's not going to instantly kill them, but that you know constant stress level does take a toll and you'll, you'll watch them wither away over time. Not so fun. I, I hope the next one I don't need to really bring up, but you know things I can eat or ass, you need to be avoided. And uh, the last one that sometimes people don't think about are, are carpet nems, are really bad combination with wrasses. It's kind of a matter of time before they uh, dart into it. Um, not necessarily intentionally, it's that, uh, you know, darting away for escape and just run right into a carpet nem. You know, so uh, a tank like this, terrible idea. Don't put a wrass in there. Next point was feeding. Uh, so meaty foods two to three times a day. I know I said up to four earlier, which is, you know, fine. You know, more is better if you're willing to do that. Uh, and so on that note, if, if the thought of throwing that much sort of food or nutrient in your tank scares you, we should just cease talking right now. <laughs> um, they're a lot like an anthea. You've always heard how antheas have this, you know, fast metabolism, small stomach. You need to feed them a lot. Brasses aren't terribly different. They're not quite as demanding as antheas in that regard, but they're not so far away. Uh, refugiums can help, but you shouldn't rely on them. Um, I've seen people say, you know, before, Oh, I've got a fuge with lots of pods in it, so I'm good. I can feed, you know, every couple days and be fine. Uh, probably not. Uh, maybe, but probably not. So things I like to feed personally are what's down here at the bottom. Um, PE mysis has been a long time go-to. Um, I'll, I'll use LRS or, or rods quite a bit. I don't have a huge preference between the two. It's kind of whatever I can buy. Um, Pellet-wise, these days I've been using the PE mysis pellets. I like them quite a lot. I've done other pellets in the past. Uh, I'm not super brand preferential on pellets, but I do really like these right now for the time being. Uh, so en enough room. Um, the, the big yellow box is what you need to take away first and foremost. Is the bigger your tank is, the more risks you can take and the more things you can get away with, with if you will, in terms of, of mixing and putting things together. Um, all genera grasses are pretty active swimmers and they need swimming space. Uh, I, I won't super cover the, my, my bullet points here, um, but you know, I, I kind of have this progression of, of tank sizes where I think the door kind of opens for things in terms of what you can get away with. Um, the first two are certainly worth mentioning because you know this 29 or bio cube size tank, I, I have, I'm seeing so many times of people putting fish in there that really don't belong. And so, uh, in, in my opinion, strong opinion, the only wrasses that are suitable for that size of tank are your, your possums or the pink straight grasses. Anything else just doesn't have enough room. Um, and, and so, you'll see lots of times for like flash grasses is that the minimum requirements is about 30 gallons. So, people will put them in there and think they can get away with it. Uh, but I won't put a flash in anything less than three feet length, uh, a three foot tank. Um, regardless of what the, the gallon size is. And it's really just because they will use that space if they have it. When they really get to do their thing and uh, turn their nuptial colors and, and you know, flash out and do the thing that makes them the most fun to actually keep as a fish, uh, they'll, they'll easily dart you know, two to three feet across the tank. Um, so they, they just, they need that space. And then so there's a door, you know, as, as your tank gets bigger, the door opens up for what you can keep. And the bottom line is, you know, 90 or more is, is kind of where the door is pretty wide open. Um, you know, 120 or more, you can do just about uh, any species that we commonly see in the trade that's reef safe. Um, mixing. So nature's pretty brutal. And as I said earlier, but, you know, harems, pears are just, they, they don't ever work out. It's, it's this limited time offer thing and your females transition to male as a matter of time. Uh, I, I definitely recommend to stick to just one species, or, sorry, one specimen of any given species. And it doesn't have to be males, you know, so some people see that and think, you know, oh, I need to buy all super males to begin with or, or terminal males or whatever marketing term you want to put on there. That's a topic in itself, and maybe I'll touch on that later. Um, but no, it's totally not the case. Uh, females will almost always transition the male at some point in time. Um, it's not an exact science, you know, people ask that question too. Well, if I buy females, how long will it take before I get a male? 
I don't know. How old is the fish? What other fish do you have in the tank? It's, it's a very variable process. It could be it could be literally a month, or it could be two years down the road. Completely depends. Uh, and and so everything I'm going to talk about to you in, in mixing, it's it's totally not an exact science. These are kind of just general guidelines. Um, this is what I know to work, but it doesn't always work. And sometimes you can do things that I um, would shy away from that that may work. Uh, and so if you're going to start mixing species, the, the one thing you do uh, need to be doing is, is watching out for this problematic aggression and being uh, willing and able, able to catch a fish and, and remove it if things don't go right. Um, and so I touched on that earlier too, but what I, this problematic aggression label, I, I look at that as, as any sort of, of constant chasing, which is resulting in obviously physical harm, you know, nipping, scales missing, uh, torn fins, that sort of thing. Uh, but the biggest point is is one fish being constantly bullied into hiding. Uh, if if somebody is being um, so dominant that it's it's forcing another fish to constantly hide in the hole, especially when you go to feed and they don't even let them come out and eat, uh, it's a slow recipe for failure. So one of the things you can definitely do to be vigilant for this and 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 sort of nip things in the bud before it's even a problem is to use an acclimation box and you get to put new fish in the tank. Uh, I'll, I'll cover what exactly that looks like a bit more in a minute, um, but my general rules for that are to be patient, give it at least two to three days, sometimes even up to a week to kind of keep an eye on things and observe before you let them out. And if you see any of those sort of problematic aggression, you know, th through the clear box, uh, either way for the fish in the box or the fish in the tank, um, you need to rethink things and, and definitely not let them out. Okay, so. These are what I label as the reef safe genera, and, and I'll just quickly skim through the list, but uh, an abscess or tamarins, your cirilobarus or your fairies, halicorus, uh, levroids or, or the cleaner wrasses, macrophagnon, your leopards, your uh, paracolinus, flashers, pseudoclinus, the, the lion species, pseudoclinops, which is just the pink streak is all that's in that genus. Uh, the pseudojuloids, which are the pencils, and the wet morellas, the, the possum wrasses. Two things that are missing from here, intentionally so, are the chorus genus and the thalassoma genus. Um, I, I'll, I don't really have anything in here particularly to talk about, my, my rant on common names, but this is kind of a good, good spot to bring it in. In, in that chorus is a genus, and so one fish, and I will talk about this later, but one fish that gets labeled incorrectly all the time is the one that people like to call the yellow chorus. Uh, it's actually a halochorus in its genus. It's not a chorus wrasse at all, and so that's a, you know, a, a, a misnomer, a, a bad association, um, because chorus wrasses, okay, so a better example maybe is the red chorus, which actually is in the chorus genus. Chorus wrasses are not the best reef um, reef fish to put in your tank, true chorus wrasses. You can do it, but you need to know some things about chorus wrasses and, and be prepared and have your tank fit up to be able to handle them. Um, however, <laughs> the thalassomas are really pretty evil and something that you should never ever consider putting in a reef tank. Um, so the two that I think come up most frequent there are probably the, the lunar wrasse or the, um, the one that gets called the banana wrasse. It's kind of the, the yellow thalassoma, if you will. Uh, they just tend to turn into terrors and some of the more aggressive thalassoma species will literally go after other fish and, and remove their eyes when they don't like them. So first up, fairy wrasses, um, the ones that I kind of think of as the crown jewel. Uh, over 60 species here, you find them all over the world, uh, shallow depths down to several hundred feet. Uh, they are protogenous hermaphrodites, which is a fancy way to say that juvies become female and then they transition to male uh, from there as the environment requires. And, and so what exactly does that mean? We'll, we'll get there more in a minute, but it's important to kind of think about this, this progression, this timeline, if you will, that uh, things are down here at female, and then they move to this sub-male or transitional male state. Uh, at this point in time, things are still a bit fluid. Uh, depending on, on harem dynamics, these sub-males can actually get pushed back to female and, and slightly you know, remorph their appearance and be uh, genetically female once again. 
However, if they continue down this path and chain, they, they enter this, this terminal male state. And that's quite literally why it's called that, uh, because once they reach a terminal male, their, their uh, fluidity is, is no longer. They are terminally a male. They can't go the other direction again. Um, and, and so this, this point in time, there's lots of marketing terms here, but terminal male, super male, um, um, alpha male, it's, it's whatever you want to call it. Um, it all means the same thing. Uh, it just depends on uh, how much someone wants to hype it up for a price tag. Uh -huh. Kind of hence why I like to start down here on the left side, because not only do they tend to be younger and smaller, but you get to keep them for more years and kind of you know, watch them progress along the way. Everything in this genus is sexually dichromatic, which is, just means that they, they visually look different between male and female. They live in harems in the wild, and you kind of get one terminal male, one alpha to this group of females. And within that, there are some sub-males in the mix. And you can kind of think of, think of those as, as males in waiting. They're, they're waiting for that terminal male to um, get eight or get old and die or, you know, who knows, right? But they're, they're waiting to basically slide into that, that alpha male slot. Um, and it's really the presence of the alpha male that keeps them down at that sub-male state. Uh, and, and so that's kind of what it is, you know, as the environment requires, they'll, they'll continue on that, that progression. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, pretty much all the males are, are just jiving to be the alpha male, and it's pretty much one at a time for that whole group. And so you can kind of translate that then to tank dynamics as well. And, and it's what I've seen happen so many times that if I, if I try a pair, uh, eventually that female starts to become a submale and then they squabble. And generally speaking, that, that now submale will become the new dominant alpha male and, and you know, bully the other one off. And if, you know, if, if I'm going to remove one at that point, it kind of depends on which one I, I may pick to remove. Um, but, you know. Unless your tank is big and like, you know, now at 300 gallons, I'm kind of big enough to get away with two males of the same species if I want to let it be. But, you know, even still, sometimes they can pretty much single each other out and see right across the tank and it, it's, it just won't work. And so I hope all that made that pretty clear in the sense that it's all this, you know, dominance and submission in, in their, their order amongst themselves. Um, just like Anthea's. Uh, and there's there's no you know bonding that occurs. And, and I, I put it in quotes because I see the marking terms sometimes on pairs, you know, oh, a bonded pair of brasses. No, no, that just that doesn't work like that. Uh, <laughs> there's no such thing. Uh, and so when they do spawn, typically the, the males will court the females and they'll spawn uh, upwards into the water column. And it, it's a pelagic spawn is what, what that's called, uh, meaning it just occurs in the water column. Um, some species do it pure horizontally, but most of the time it's, it's this, you know, upward dance. It's on the watch if you ever can see it. There's actually YouTube videos out there. I know there's some good ones of, of Temaniki spawning um, somewhere off the coast of Japan. Okay, uh, most of the species here have this ability to, to, to flash, uh, which is, you know, what we'll call when they, they kind of do this on-off light switch and, and flip their colors and, and, and uh, flare their fins. And uh, when that gets really dramatic is when you get nuptial coloration and it's, um, it's, it's almost like electric, you know, it's, it's, it looks like a battery powered fish then at that point when they light up into those colors. Okay, the fairy grasses are all relatively hardy and pretty easy to keep. Um, terminal males can be a bit more prone to shipping stress if you're, you know, doing something through the mail. Uh, smaller sub males or females do tend to ship a little bit better. It's not that a terminal male is always going to die in shipping by any means. They just tend to, you know, show up a bit more stressed out. Not a super big deal, but something you might want to be aware of. They're always really active, voracious eaters. If you see a fairy ass that doesn't eat well in, in a tank in a store, there's definitely something going on. Uh, they don't require a sand bed. They'll sleep in a mucus cocoon in, in the rock work or in a hole someplace, you know, wherever they can feel safe. We can divide this genus up into complexes. That's a whole separate talk in itself. You've maybe seen the uh, the the, uh, the complex chart, you know, the fairy rash chart, as it gets called. Um, and and so that's useful in terms of mixing species within the fairy rash genus. And so to that point, you can certainly keep more than one species in the same aquarium um, uh, within this genus. 
uh, but they're not all equal. Some of the, the ones that are super more on the aggressive side that I just would flat out avoid if you're trying to mix fairy grasses are, are those six at the bottom, but the Adorn, the Connie, uh, Filamentosa, which is the whip fin, uh, by far the most evil of the genus, just flat out incompatible with other, other fairies or flashers. Uh, red velvet, that's the ruby squamous, um, can sometimes get pretty pushy and aggressive, not always, that's kind of a hit or miss species, but I'd still be cautious with it. Scots are also pretty bad, um, and they tend to fade in coloration, I don't recommend them for much. And then the Tanozukai is not too removed from filamentosis and can almost be as nasty sometimes. And so here's that chart I talked about a minute ago. I won't spend much time here because I could literally spend 15 minutes talking about this and I've got about 50 slides and I'm probably about a quarter, a third of the way through. Um, so this is out there. It's definitely posted on Humblefish. It's on various places as well. It's on Facebook and, and Phillips uh, Rast Lovers group. Um, if you've got questions here, let me know. I have no problem covering it. We can come back to it if I need to. I know I showed this picture in my talk, but I, I really like it. Uh, this is off Japan as well from a, a pretty good uh, underwater photographer that likes to do quite a bit. Uh, but this is a uh, Cirrolabris lunatus, uh, the lunate or crested tail fairy wrasse. Uh, and, and what I like about this picture is it's a great example of kind of what a harem looks like, you know, hiding in some coral cover, uh, all eyes on the photographer. But uh, you can not only see the, the sexually dichromatism here, um, but you know this is the terminal male with, with these colors next to uh, a, a more drab female on both sides of him. But the other neat thing to point out here is this guy over on the right is a, is a sub-male. Uh, you can see in coloration he's somewhere in between these two. Um, and so this is, you know, one of those males in waiting, if you will. He's, he's waiting for something to happen to this guy to, to take his spot. Uh, and so some of that, that nuptial coloration, just to make a quick example of it, but uh, Cyrillabus johnson I, one of my personal favorite species within the genus, but this is a, a male and female over here on the left. Um, this is in a tank of the past of my own. Uh, but this is the male on top, and then again down here um, in, in flashed out color, so you can see, you know, the fins uh, flared out. And the cool thing about a Johnson eye is it kind of gets like this iridescent patch behind the head when it gets into its uh, flashed nuptial colors, and it's just, it's so fun. But literally on the right, this is the same fish, just in his normal coloration. And, um, you know, fins are down, a lot less color, that uh, spot behind the head is just non-existent. Okay, uh, cover the flash of grasses quick. There's over 25 different species here, also protogenous hermaphrodites and sexually dichromatic. Um, things that's a little bit different here within this genus compared to the fairies is that the females pretty much all look alike. Um, there's kind of some groups here as well, and females within those various subgroups definitely all look alike. There's some difference between those different groups, but um, it's it's also kind of hard to find female flashers uh, in the trade. You sometimes can, they often get mislabeled. Uh, sometimes they'll even get, well, sometimes they'll see sub males that are, you know, mislabeled as female, but I'm not too bothered with that. Definitely also live in harems, but these harems can get mixed up and we do get uh, hybridization and across to those two species that we can find together. They are a bit more prone to shipping stress. Flashers can get really spooky. Uh, they definitely like to play possum too, if you will. Uh, they'll they'll uh, you know play dead in a bag or in a bucket during acclimation. Um, they'll sometimes even fool me. You know, I'll, I'll stare hard and look for the gills to move and go. Okay, you're not as dead as you seem to look. Uh, they're they're also very active. They're even more spooky than fairies, and uh, flashers will definitely uh, jump pretty readily when they're spooked. They do have a pretty short lifespan, and that's an important point. It's about four years. That's about all you'll get out of a flasher. And more to the point of why I really don't like to buy terminal males, especially flasher, I just I won't even do it at all anymore. Uh, you know, a terminal male flasher, you might only keep him for six months before you know his life is up. Uh, maybe you'll get a year or two, but that's about all you'll really get. Um, and so I don't even keep a whole lot of flashers anymore, just because I kind of get tired of the short lifespan. Um, but you know, they're still um, fun and attractive. And uh, you're a great fish, as long as you're you know, aware that you won't have them all that long. 
they're definitely the best example of that flashing ability, hence why they get called flashers. Uh, and it's it's very much like an on-off light switch, even more so than the fairy, but can be pretty similar. You can keep multiple species here in the same aquarium as well. Um, and they also sleep in a mucus cocoon, no sand required. Uh, so here's you know a great example of, of a flasher's ability to flash. And you can see it's a bit more dramatic than the Johnston I showed you a moment ago. But this is the uh, Octotania. This is the eight-line flasher from the Red Sea. Only it's endemic of the Red Sea. This is quite literally the same fish left and right sides, and there's not a whole lot of color correction in either picture. That's pretty true to form. Uh, so same fish, you know, light switch on, light switch off. Um, not only do you get all the colors, but the, you know, the other really cool thing about the flashers is all those, you know, blue iridescent lines on it that are present when they're not flashed out. You can see them, but when they really, you know, flip the switch on is, is all those blue lines get super iridescent and shimmery. And, um, you know, it's it's like they have their own power source. This is, I've got a couple slides on the species that are real all close to one another that commonly get mixed up uh, that I can quickly point out the differences to you. But these three here, Macoscari, Carpenteri, and Flavinolis uh, are the, the three that are real common and always mixed up. Um, and so the easy ways to tell them apart are Macoscari is, will only ever have one filament on his dorsal fin. And the anal fin is just red on the outer part. Uh, red on the outer part is also unique to Carpentaria though, but the big difference with Carpentaria is you get two to four dorsal filaments. It'll never have just one, it's always got two or more. Um, it's worth noting that dorsal filaments can get damaged and broken off or chomped off, you know, uh, but the dorsal filaments will grow back. Uh, it's a soft ray, so it's soft tissue, and the fish will regenerate those. So sometimes you might see like a carpenter's that's got, you know, a couple, and then you see that like little, little nubby stubs of ones that you've, you know, if you look close, those used to be a dorsal filament, they will be again, give them some time, a few weeks typically to grow back. And then uh, Flavianalis or the yellow fin, that's the only one that's got the totally yellow anal fin, and then you'll get anywhere from one to four dorsal filaments there. Um, uh, two is pretty common. Occasionally, you will see them with only one, and then it's, it's easy to tell apart from McCoskers in that scenario because of that totally yellow anal fin. And then the others that tend to get mixed up a lot are the cyanus, uh, uh, so the blue fin, or blue flasher, linea punctatus, that's the, that one has a few different names, but uh, line dash, dot dash, uh, I'm trying to remember now what else it'll get called. Um, and then uh, filamentosis is one that's kind of similar to these two also that tend, people tend to mix up. The biggest difference between cyanus and linea punctatus, and really the only good visual difference is the shape of the tail. The blue flasher gets this crescent tape shale and uh, the line, line spot tends to get this you know, rounded or flat tail, however you want to think about it. Um, filamentosis does have the crescent tail as well, but there's kind of some features between it and cyanus that are are different, the, the anal fin's different. The general coloration is different too. These tend to be a bit more blue or purpley, and these tend to be a bit more orange or red. Okay, talk about the leopard grasses. 12 plus species here. Also sexually dichromatic, but a bit more subtle. Uh, they're in harems, but a bit different in the sense that they don't stick to a very tight group. They kind of have their, their home range, if you will. Um, it's still, you know, a very, very distinct area. Um, it's you know it's it's spread out across yards, not not uh, you know football fields by any means. Um, they're pretty delicate shippers and pretty high casualty rate in shipping. Not as bad as like the tamarins, but not too far away. They're pretty prone to stress, and just you know moving them from one tank to another can be really stressful on them. Um, for that note, and for this group, uh, tank transfer is not the greatest thing to be doing with leopard grasses. It tends to be pretty attacking on them. If, if you know in the QT process. Um, males of different species don't always mix so well and for that point I tend to just tell people if you're going to do various leopard species stick to just one male of any of those species and make sure all the others of different species are females. If your tank is bigger you might be able to flex that and get away with more. Um, females of different species are okay and I hope that was clear and uh, you need a sufficient population, pod population here for them to graze. Um, they'll definitely feed when you feed, but when you're not feeding them, they're always cruising the tank looking for food. Uh, they're 
on these, you know, touchy delicate notes, this is not a, a uh, genera that I would suggest people start with. You know, if you've never kept rasses, you should definitely start with fairies or flashers and do some of these guys later. Um, they do sleep in the sand, and an important note for any species or genus that sleeps in the sand, don't dig them up. Um, you know, it's a, a common thing for to put a, a sand sleeper in a tank and they disappear in the sand for several days, you know, a week or two even, and uh, inexperienced people tend to, to panic and, you know, think, I need to find that fish, and, and digging them out of the sand when they're alive, which, a side note to that, they almost never die in the sand, they'll always surface to die if that's what's going to happen. Um, when they're in the sand, they're they're doing that to seek refuge and digging them out. It's just adding more to their stress level. It, it you know people do it with the best intentions, but it's really counterproductive. By and large, the two most common species of lepers are these two: just the uh, the Malagris, or just the commonly labeled leper grass, and then the uh, blue star um, African. Several different common names that get thrown on on bipartitus. Um, but uh, you'll most typically see the females for sale. You'll occasionally see a male. They're quite a bit different in appearance, a lot more green. Um, males of the species can be pretty aggressive and uh, can, in smaller tanks, even be known to kill off females. So uh, definitely be a bit hesitant of males here. Um, but, but the females of both species, left and right, are really common, pretty easy to get a hold of. Uh, so on that, you know, they're, they're sexually dichromatic here within the genus, but more subtle. This is a great example is, is uh, Jeff Roy or the Potter's Leopard, as it typically gets labeled. But this is the male on top, female on the bottom. You can see there's some things that are different between the two species, but, or between the two pictures, rather. Um, but it's a lot more subtle than some of the fairies and flashers, for sure. Uh, and, and to that note, the ornate or, or ornatus, um, also pretty commonly available, but definitely the trickiest leopard species to tell apart between male and female. And the, the submale phase can be really gray uh, to, to determine what's a female from a submale. Talk about the, the tamarins now or the anapsis a little bit. 12 different species here, like a lot, a lot like a leopard where they're in a loose harem and you know males have a range. Uh, also, it's actually dichromatic, uh, but there are some species of, of uh, tamarins that are, the females are just as attractive as the males, sometimes more so, and that's where Femininus gets its name. Um, they're, by and large, the poorest chipper of all brief safe genera. Uh, they can damage their mouth and jaws during transit or even in a QT tank that's pretty sparse. Um, by literally trying to, trying to dive through the bottom of the tank or bag. And uh, to, to that note, one thing you always need to do if you're buying one in a local store is to take a good look at the mouth. And uh, if you see, you know, any exposed bones or um, broken, missing lower jaws can be common too. Um, just avoid the fish. It's going to be a real uphill battle if, if uh, not impossible at that point. Um, not to say you can't find a good one in the store by any means, uh, you definitely can, but just, you know, know what to look for. What else to say here? They're, they, they're definitely hardy once you get them established. It's just getting them through that shipping and transit and QT process and getting them into a tank in good health. Once you get them to that point, they're pretty easy. They're no harder than a leopard, really. Uh, but they're certainly challenging to get to that point. You can mix species within the genus here for sure. Uh, they're also a sand sleeper. A um, couple of the somewhat more common ones these days are the yellowtail tamarind on the left. That's uh, Malagris is the species name. And then uh, Neogonaceus, the uh, black back, New Guinea, China. I, I don't know, it's got several different names that get thrown on it too. Um, it's pretty pretty easy to get a hold of. It comes out of many places in the in the Pacific Ocean. The two species that everybody pretty much knows and admires, if you know uh, this genus at all, is Femininus on the left and then Lenardi on the right. Um, so kind of back to that, that namesake on Femininus, um, people like to think the females are, are more attractive than the males down here at the bottom. This male is a little bit flashed out in coloration. Uh, the males are a bit more muted in their normal coloration. That's this blue iridescence pattern 
uh, tends to, to tone down in the normal coloration of the fish. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think both male and females are, are super um, neat to watch and keep here in this species, but okay. Lenardi can be a bit on the tricky side. Uh, it's real hard for people to have long-term success with the species for various reasons. Um, I've never attempted it myself. Uh, there's a few success stories, but, but not many. And the price tag of both of these tends to be about the same. Um, can be around a thousand bucks, can be a little less, depends on, on the year. Okay, Halicorus. Uh, this is definitely the, the catch-all genus, if you will. There's over 75 different unique species here, and uh, it, it tends to be many of the, uh, the Ithio people have agreed that uh, there's a big split and reorganization needs to be done within the Halicorus genus. Um, they're also definitely sexually dichromatic in their various species. They occur in, uh, in loose harems also. Uh, they have a lot of species on the dorsal fins. They have these eye spots. Uh, we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, but they're kind of false eyes. They're just there to confuse uh, predators and keep down on, on predation of the species. They're reef safe-ish in the sense that a lot of the uh, species here are, are pretty easy to keep in a reef tank, uh, but they may go after some of your uh, ornamental in invertebrates or your model inverts. So uh, feather dusters, but I, when I say that, I mean the small ones, like the little white ones that you might get in your tank, not not like the big cocoa worms, not the ones you intentionally have, the ones that showed up in your tank that you never planned on, but hey, they're there. Uh, some of your smaller snails they might go after, and definitely your hermits, uh, other crabs, small shrimp, um, sexy shrimp-like would be just, uh, just wondrous snacks for these guys. Bigger shrimp are generally okay, um, but, but also be careful. If, uh, if they see you add those shrimp, you know, like peppermint shrimp is a good example. If, if they see you put those shrimp in, in the middle of the day, they might associate those with food because they're watching you add them and you might've just, you know, fed them an expensive snack. Uh, the safer species are definitely the smaller ones, the ones that are like five to six inches or less at maturity. And the ones that get over that are definitely ones I would not put in a reef tank. Um, so like the, the checkered or marble, I'll show you a picture in a moment is one that gets sold quite a bit that I would not put in a reef tank myself. Um, can be done, but I would only do it in a tank that's like, you know, a thousand gallons or more kind of thing. Uh, they're, they're a lot like a leopard that they constantly graze and look for food, um, a bit more inquisitive than a leopard and they'll even, you know, like inspect your corals and, and you know, pick things off corals if they see things there. Uh, to that note, sometimes people will think, oh, you know, uh, this melon earth is eating my coral. No, it's eating something that's on your coral, not the coral itself. Um, mixing halicorus uh, usually works. It depends on which species we're mixing. There is a lot of caveats there, and uh, some species definitely don't mix well with other species. They also sit in the sand bed and eat sand for them. Okay. <laughs> One of the favorite tangents of mine is, is, and this is my mini rant on common names, is Christmas grass. That's a really common label that gets slapped on things, and it can mean a whole lot of different things. And so here are three species that will commonly get called Christmas grass, but they are three unique, different species with different traits, and they are not all created equally. Uh, Biosalatus, or the red line wrasse, as I'd rather call it, is uh, over here on the left. Claudia is in the middle and uh, the ornate or ornatassimus, which uh, probably see less because most of these came out of Hawaii before. And I don't think I've seen any now for several months, which would jive with uh, the Hawaii collection being shut off. But um, the good news is ornatassimus is, is the biggest and the most ornery and the one I would not mix with others at all. So I'm, I'm not so sad to see it no longer available for the, uh, the uh, unknowledgeable hobbyist. Claudia typically comes out of the Pacific regions, lots of times around Fiji. Um, it's, it's typically pretty mild in its, in its uh, temperament. And the red line is really easy to get, comes out of a lot of places in the Pacific. And uh, they're pretty mild typically as well. You know, so these two species, uh, left and middle, can be mixed with others, but I, I wouldn't do it with uh, the ornate on the right. Um, while I'm here, I'll cover those eye spots. I talked about those a moment ago. So the dorsal fin, false eyes, or eye spots as you'd like to call them. Um, Beosalatus has three of them when they're juvies. 
clotting just as the one in the middle. So, you know, different species will have different numbers of those eye spots. Uh, the thing that's pretty common to all the species is the ones that are down towards the tail and sometimes even down at the, the tip of the uh, dorsal anterior posterior end of the dorsal. Um, those will definitely fade away as I start to transition into a submale. And I'd have to think real hard about this, but I can't think off the top of my head any terminal male species of, of any halicorus that has any eye spots left. The terminal males, they tend to disappear on all of them. I mentioned Melanurus a moment ago, and so here's a good example of, you know, a female or juvie that's got those eye spots, and then the male has now lost all of them. You can see a tiny bit of one left here down towards the uh, base of the caudal, um, but that'll fade away in time, too, as this, this, as this fish gets older and more mature. And then this is that, that marble that I mentioned earlier. Um, a pretty commonly available species could often get sold at like a two inch size and it's you know pretty attractive. Looks really cute. Yeah, but later it turns into about an eight inch uh, full grown fish. And it's not a bad species, but it's just, it's a real good invert eater when it gets to that size. And it gets you know pretty hard to keep you know, most snails in the tank. Um, so you can do it. You just need to be aware of uh, what that fish is going to be eating when it gets big. A few more. These are other ones that are really common. And so I talked about this one earlier, but this is a uh, Halicorus chrysis or the canary wrasse, yellow wrasse. Please call it these things. Don't call it the yellow chorus because it's not a chorus wrasse at all. Uh, it's got a, a counterpart. It's a sister species. Uh, this kind of gets called the yellow and purple yellow and white, yellow, lemon ring. I, I hate common names, um, but it gets called lots of things. That, and literally the only two difference in these two species uh, is, is how they look. Behavior is the same between them. I wouldn't really mix them together because it's probably just going to be a fight later. Um, the species I personally like a lot is, is Iridus. That's the radiant wrasse. Typically down towards Africa is where most of them are collected. So it's a bit sporadic in its availability. It looks super drab and boring in pictures, but when you actually see one in person, this fish has a, an appeal to it that uh, you can't appreciate until you see one, but this kind of reddish brown has a nice iridescence to it. And then a species I personally hate that often gets um, sold to people who are, you know, unknowing and what they're buying is the one gets, that gets called the green chorus. Again, not a chorus at all. Um, it, it's also a halochorus, and as a juvie, it kind of ends up being this, you know, really fluorescent, bright, attractive green, but as that fish gets older and matures, it dulls out to this kind of silvery gray, hardly green at all. And also when it gets mature, it tends to be a bit on the aggressive side, and it, it really loves to eat your model inverts also. Um, this species is a jerk, just, just don't. Okay, pencil wrasses. Uh, ten species here, definitely delicate shippers as well. Also difficult, don't do these if you uh, aren't pretty good at keeping wrasses. Um, some species can be a bit easier than others. Uh, it depends. Um, I wouldn't keep them with aggressive wrasses at all. These guys are, are pretty timid and shy in behavior, and you keep them with things that are a bit more pushy. Uh, you can actually see the submales revert to female here just from the pressure of other wrasses in the tank. Uh, so, so they can do really well in a reef tank. You just need to have the right environment and tank mix for them. I would definitely tend to purchase one of these locally, eating good condition. Uh, you could mail order them, but you know, be careful as to where you're getting them from. Uh, definitely very sexually dichromatic, and they also sleep in the sand. Uh, a species that's super attractive, haven't seen it now for several years, comes out of the, um, the Southern Pacific, but the Tavi. Uh, this is the female at the bottom, male at the top. Um, so, you know, super different in appearance. Uh, Saracinus was, is the Hawaiian endemic species, but it's got some other counterparts that will come out of the uh, Philippines and Indonesia, uh, um, Splendensis or the Splendid Pencil. Uh, it looks really similar to this guy, it just has a few more different markings on the, on the gill plates on the head. And the, the females look the same too uh, on, on the counterpart species to this guy, where they're, you know, kind of this uniform pink. Um, uh, one that you also see quite a bit is uh, Cerevensi. This is the, the royal pencil. Um, pretty common also. Pseudoclinus. These are the lined wrasses. These are the just don't do it species, but we'll get there. So the, the four lines, six lines, eight lines, 
Um, important distinction there, there's an eight-lined wrasse and there's the eight-lined flasher wrasse, two very different species, but again, common name can uh, mislead you. Um, seven different species here. These are not sexually dichromatic. You can't tell a male and female apart. And they're also not very hermetic uh, in the sense that they live pretty, pretty much in solitude and uh, don't pay super close attention to their counterparts in the wild. Um, once they're established in a tank, they can get really belligerent towards other asses. And to, to that point, just consider them in, incompatible with other asses. That's a safe bet to go there. They're a really hardy genus, and, and so they're also a great uh, hunter for pods and pests, uh, and even your ornamental shrimp. Um, and so where I think all of these uh, species in this genus have a great application is for frag tanks. Um, if I was to have a frag tank, I would definitely have a, a, a lined raft in it just to be a, a, a pest hunter, if you will. They ship pretty easy. These guys are, are pretty hardy, pretty resilient. Uh, they also sleep in a mucus cocoon, so no sand required, kind of back to that frag tank thing, you know, bare bottom tank would be fine. Uh, some pictures of the ones that you've probably all come to know, but the sixth line, yeah, don't, don't ever do it. Uh, the mystery can get pretty aggressive and uh, pretty big. If you've ever seen a full-grown mystery wrasse, um, it'll, it'll kind of surprise you how, how girthy and big that fish can get. Um, there's a split in uh, the octatania, the pseudocolinus octatania, uh, in the sense that's the eight line, uh, eight lined wrasse, in the sense that the ones that come out of Hawaii, which I don't think we'll see anymore with the trade being shut off there, uh, but the ones that come from Hawaii look different than the ones that come out of Indonesia. Will someone eventually split these into two different species? Maybe, but for now they're the same. Uh, the disappearing or the striated, uh, this is a Vandius at the bottom. This one's a bit more mild in temperament, but I still wouldn't mix anything. And then the four line over here at the uh, lower left. I, yeah. I've never kept one, have no desire to keep one. We'll never keep one. Pseudocolinips. Uh, this is the, the pink streak grass. This is the only guy in this genus. And you can see, you know, in appearance, it looks a lot like some of the lion grasses. Uh, it initially was there in its taxonomy and got split off later um, for some subtle differences. But for us, the important difference is these guys are, are really shy, very timid, not at all like the uh, pseudocolinus rasses. Um, they, lots of similarity there, there there's no sexually dichromatic, uh, and they also sleep in a mucus cocoon, don't need sand. Um, I have kept this species in a frag tank before, and I think they're great for that. They're also great for you know, your smaller tanks. Uh, they'll mix with anything else that's peaceful. Um, they, they are going to shy away from, from anything that wants to be a bit at all aggressive towards them. Possum wrasses, great species for smaller tanks. Also, these guys are pretty small in their full grown size. Three different species here. They all uh, look the same, males and females of each species. Uh, yellow banded down here at the lower left. This is the uh, white banded in the middle. And then Tanaka's at the lower right. And it's kind of a subtle difference between Tanaka's and the white banded. Um, also small, cryptic, sleep in a cute mucus cocoon, no sand needed. Cleaner asses. Spend a little bit of time here, but um, there's kind of a, a misconception that, you know, lots of cleaner asses are just, you know, feeding on parasites and removing dead scales and tissue from other fish. And they're actually their primary diet is the slime coat of other fish, is what they're really getting their, their nutrition from. There's one study out there that showed a negative impact on a wild reef after cleaners were removed uh, from that particular reef, because typically there's a pair of cleaners on um, a certain area of a reef. And so when those pair of cleaners were removed, that, that reef had a, uh, a downturn in its overall health. The subsequent question to that that didn't really get answered in that study or has ever since is, you know, well, how long did it take for another pair of cleaners to move in and, and, and you know, re-inhabit that area? Uh, so don't know how long that effect may last for, but um, there's at least some evidence that removing them in the wild may not be the best thing to do just to keep you aware of that. Uh, their survival in Aquaria can be pretty poor. Um, they can be okay also, but you know where they do best is in a, a big tank with other big fish to uh, feed off of. Um, putting them in smaller tanks or in tanks with only smaller fish generally doesn't work out all that great. Uh, 
so back to their, their feeding habits, I mean, they're, they're going to be um, looking to feed off of other fish and, and clean them. And so, you know, bigger fish that they can, you know, pester and, uh, and, and do that too, they'll typically put up with them and aren't too bothered or stressed out by it. But, you know, smaller fish, if they're constantly getting pestered by cleaners, are, are also uh, taking a toll on, on their health. Um, where was I with, what did I miss? Uh, pairing, just don't, don't try to pair anything here. You can't tell males and females apart. And uh, if, if they are two males, they will certainly kill one off. Um, and so, you know, I tend to tell people just not to buy cleaners. If people are really interested in cleaners, there is, you know, the right situation to do it, but you should be aware of those needs ahead of time. If you're really gonna do it, uh, the species that'll do best is the blue streak, uh, which is what you see in the left there. And the one you absolutely must avoid, and again, I don't know if we'll see it much with the white being shut off, uh, is the Hawaiian cleaner, probably the most attractive species, but it's also the poorest in survival rate. Another thing about cleaners, I love this slide, but there's other species that get, you know, labeled as a cleaner ass and even sold as a cleaner ass. We're back to that, that common name, right? Where the one on the left you see there can get labeled as the yellowtail cleaner. And the one on the right will typically get labeled as the Red Sea cleaner. Um, but if we're paying attention to, to uh, Latin names, you'll see both of these have a different genus than, than uh, what the, the, the common cleaner rash genus is. And so both of these species are common in the sense that as a juvenile, they tend to clean other fish. You know, they tend to act as a, as a cleaner wrasse. But as these species mature, both of them are an obligate coral bore, which means they only eat corals. That's their diet. That's what they feed on. Um, and specifically SPS because, you know, they have small mouths. Um, so these species are, are great if you want to rid yourself of some SPS corals in your tank, but typically most of us don't want to do that. So uh, avoid these species. Okay, mixing different species genus. I've talked about it to some degree here, but it's a lot like tangs. Um, genus matters. You need to pay attention to those Latin names. It, it tells you so much. Uh, you can mix most genera within themselves. Um, there's some exceptions there I've kind of talked about along the way, like the, the pseudocolinus is one just to don't do it. It won't work. Um, certainly, it's not an exact science. I can only give you my best known guidelines on how to do it. And it, even within that may not always work. Um, so I mentioned earlier, but, you know, catch and remove one if you need to talked about this problematic aggression before. I won't cover it again, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm stressing it enough that it's, you know, sinking in. Um, okay, so general rules here, if, if you're interested in, in mixing races, is to not do more than one male of the same species. Um, well, not do more than one specimen of, of the same species. That's the easiest way to, to not do that. Uh, the, the lined races, just stay away from them. Don't mix them. Uh, I talked about that earlier too, but you know, leopard grasses, be careful if you're mixing males of different species, that can be very tumultuous. Paris trios, just, it just, just doesn't work, just don't do it. And uh, you always use an acclimation box when you're adding a new one to a tank with existing grasses. Um, and so I'll talk about that a bit more here in a sec. So acclimation boxes, the, the one, this, this is a very transient thing where what's in the market tends to change. This is the one that I'm aware of that's currently on the market that I seem to like the best. Um, but so it, it's the, the Esha ops, the tanklimate, like this is what they like to label it as. An acclimation box doesn't have to be fancy. It can be pretty simple. Really the point of it is it's a clear box with a lid that can be secured and will keep the fish inside. The subtle point of what I like about this particular model is that the bottom is not clear. Um, clear bottom acclimation boxes, the fish tends to spend a lot of time trying to, you know, dive through the invisible bottom and just tends to stress them out. So I like boxes that don't have a clear bottom. If you have an all clear box with a few obvious solutions, you could put a piece of white starboard in the bottom. You could put a thin layer of sand in the bottom just to block that view. Or if you're willing, you could just, you know, push the box all the way down the bottom of your tank and set it on the bottom of the sand bed to where, you know, the bottom is clear and visible and they don't try to do that. If you don't want to, you know, buy something super fancy, you can buy these little critter keepers uh, from any box pet store. And uh, I'm, I'm crediting, and crediting and stealing this from uh, Kevin Cohen, um, but, you know, he had said 
use a soldering iron and melt some holes in it. Uh, using a drill can leave, you know, sharp edges on the inside and that can be bad for fish to cut themselves on. So, you know, the soft edges from melted holes are good. And, uh, you know, don't do that in your little enclosed closet because it's, it's not so, uh, so great on the fume standpoint. Okay, now I'll get into some stuff on QT. Um, of course, like any fish you're going to add, like wrasses are no different in the sense that you should QT them. Um, I always do, I can't afford not to these days with what I have in my tank, some bottom line. Uh, they're in general pretty resistant to protozoa, your, your crypto, your ick, uh, velvet, brook. Um, they can get those things, but it's, it's also not super common. Uh, it is, you know, when they do get those things, it's, it's, it's certainly more possible that they can carry ick or velvet in the gills and it's not uh, visible on the fish. So there's kind of a, a hidden thing to be aware of there. The thing they're definitely most and, and very prone to are flukes, gill flukes. And uh, they can get somewhat susceptible to secondary bacterial infections from uh, wounds or injuries as well. But it, it's, it's flukes and bacterial infections that I see by and large most commonly with wrasses. Uh, so flukes, uh, really like these pictures. This is from Chuck's Addiction down here, which I think is totally dead now and not at all visible, but you'd find it on an archive. Um, but this, you know, obviously a little royal drama, but it's it's already dead here. But you can see it's covered in flukes. And so zoom in on the dorsal fin, there's these kind of like little clear, you kind of think of them as little clear flatworms um, in appearance. They're really not, they're, they're a hookworm is what they really are. I like the, the fin images over here on the right from a scanning electron microscope, but a um, uh, little leech-like, if you will, in the sense that their mouth is very hook-shaped, and this is a gill structure of a fish, and so they latch onto the gills um, and feed from the fish. Uh, why are flukes a problem is, is because they'll just literally get to the numbers that they can get so populous in the gills that they, they suffocate a fish. That's what they end up doing. They can also migrate into the fish and, you know, get into inside the tissue and, and be problematic in that way too. Um, Bobby could talk to you a lot more about that, but there's enough to, to give you a feel. QTs don't have to be expensive or fancy. Uh, mine's certainly not. I'll show you in a moment. Um, what I like to do, and you'll see it, is just a 20 gallon with a hood, a hang on back filter and a heater if necessary. I say if necessary, because I live in Phoenix. Uh, my house is never cold enough to justify a heater. Therefore, I don't even put one in a QT tank because it's just another thing that can fail. Um, those of you in the colder areas, I would put a heater in, but, you know, use discretion. Uh, a bare bottom tank with PVC pieces is all you really need for fish to hide. And if you've got a genus that's a sand sleeper, you can put in a little sand box. So I, I literally use, you know, a, a little um, square rectangular plastic container, uh, as long as it's long enough for the fish to uh, lay down in, it's big enough. So I'll take that plastic container and I'll put, you know, an inch or two of sand in it, throw it in the tank and uh, th that'll do them well. Um, they may not find that sandbox uh, in the first day or so. It might take them a night or two before they figure it out, but they will, they'll figure it out and, and it'll be fine. So uh, don't worry about it if they don't find it right away. Good antibiotics for, for rasses or, or canaplex and if you're into. Um, I always, always, always treat for flukes uh, at least two doses. If I use General Cure or Prozzi Pro, somewhat depends. It's usually more a matter of what I have on hand. I'm not super uh, picky between the two. Prozzi, of course, has got that that uh, ethanol binder and can cause a bacterial bloom in a tank. Um, and so I have had that happen as well. So Prozzi does require you to be a bit more, you know, on top of things if you're using it, but it's relatively fine. Um, if you're going to do copper, it needs to be a chelated copper, like copper power. Um, don't use a uh, Cooper mine or, or another copper product like that, something that's non-chelated uh, and uh, ionic copper. Um, I don't know the biology well enough to tell you how those two operate differently, but, but RASAs certainly do much, much better with chelated products. And the biggest thing to know is if you're doing copper to raise that level slowly. Um, you know, the instructions will tell you, hey, do it over, you know, two days, I think it is. And that's way too fast for a wrasse. It needs to be like over the course of a week. Um, I certainly absolutely recommend your Hanna copper checkers to check your levels. Uh, it'll give you an accurate number easily. A lot of the copper test kits can be pretty misleading. Okay, 
So what does my QT look like? Well, there it is. That's literally what's set up in my laundry room right now. I, I snapped this picture like mm, earlier in the week. Pretty simple. It's a 20 gallon tank, PVC in the bottom, power head just in the tank to give some better circulation, little hang on back filter. There's some filter floss in, in that hang on back filter and that's it. My light is what you see. It's, it's, a, it's a table lamp sitting on the counter. It's on a simple timer. Good enough, right? Doesn't need to be fancy. It's in a laundry room. I don't care what it looks like. Yeah, you know, wires are messy, whatever. It's all about function over form here. And so what I have on the left, I had I had um, put this up on the uh, on the forum not too long ago when someone asked, what's your QT process? I, I tend not to get too hung up on what my QT process is because I think it's much more important that people QT and exactly how you want to do it doesn't totally matter to me. Um, you know, yeah, I feel like QT is one of those things you have to find what works for you. Yeah, there's things you need to do. But also, you know, someone's methods that they prefer, you might uh, tweak a little bit more for your liking. Of course, it needs to be effective, right? I don't mean that just to say QT can be haphazardous. You know, I don't get the wrong impression here. So I'll, I'll walk you through this. But but what I do, um, I'm in Phoenix. I have a lot of fish stores nearby. The fish I like to keep generally aren't in the fish stores. Day one, fish shows up. I'll uh, I'll poke a small hole in that bag and uh, stick a pipette in or a syringe if you have it work to and take a water sample from that bag. The point is I don't want to cut the bag way open and get a whole bunch of fresh air in that bag. Been in transit, you know, for a day, sometimes a day and a half, the ammonia levels will have risen, but the O2 levels are down. So that ammonia is not really all that toxic until you open up that bag and expose it to fresh air and start to raise the pH. Uh, so poke a little hole, take a water sample, and I'll check salinity. I will match my QT to that salinity level. If it's a place I've ordered from in the past, I'll know what the salinity of that bag is going to be ahead of time. Vendor to vendor is inconsistent. You know, a lot, a lot of vendors keep things at full salt, 34, 35 PPT. And uh, a lot of the bigger wholesalers uh, or, you know, fast moving shops tend to keep their salt levels down at much lower levels, keep down their salt costs. Sometimes they do it to suppress diseases. There's various reasons. If things are coming in at a lower QT, I will dump my salinity level down on the QT to mat. I'll float them for, you know, about 20 to 30 minutes. All I'm trying to get is a temp match. If the bag water was super hot or cold, I might make that longer depending. Room temperature temp here, right? And it's just sitting in my ambient air. So for the first week, I just like to keep a close eye on things. I'll feed them regularly, you know, every day and uh, find something they like. It's typically not hard. And I typically just use what I'm currently feeding. If it's something uh, back in my main tank, if it's a fish that's a bit more picky, like a leopard or a tamarind, then I might try something like mysis or callinus. Um, but between, you know, LRS or lot rods and even the PE pellets um, and mysis and callinus, it's, it's pretty rare that I'll find something that doesn't like to eat any of those things within the first few days. Uh, so second week, then I like to do my first round of prosy. I'll, I'll do a water change and I'll um, dose uh, prosy after that. And then I'll start on a, a Metro and focus soaked food. Uh, so I'll keep their food in a separate, um, you know, container, mix it up before I feed them uh, daily and, and, and do that. Third week, then I'll do another water change, second round of prosy. If I'm going to do copper, I'll usually start on the fourth week. Uh, of course, this is all assuming that nothing has, you know, popped up ahead of time. If, if in this first week, if, if I'm seeing ick on the fish, I'm certainly not going to wait until the fourth week to start doing something about it. This is much more in a preventative sense, but I also find, you know, unless ick is visible in the fish right away out of the bag, which seems to be luckily pretty rare, uh, it'll typically not show up until the second or third week as it is. And so if it's showing up like in the third week, you know, then I'll probably wait until the fourth week to start copper. It just, it depends, right? You know, if it's, if it's barely visible and doesn't really get worse over a few days, you know, I'm okay to let things ride. But if it's velvet, uh, no, it needs to get started right away. You can't let that go. Enough, enough on the caveats. I kind of already talked about it, but uh, when you're dosing copper, you can get to that first one PPM pretty quick. I mean, you can do that over a day or two, but it's the, the, the latter rise from one to two or so uh, that needs to be spread out over several days, you know, five to six, up to a week. I personally like to take my copper level to about 1.9. I know some people will think that's on the shy side, and maybe it is. Uh, I have never had a scenario where that's not been high enough for me. I don't believe I've ever been fooled by that and inadvertently uh, brought, you know, acre velvet into a tank. I can't say it's impossible either. You know, I mostly keep grasses, and so... If there were low levels of acre velvet in the tank, it could just be in gills, and I'd never really know about it. 
Um, but to the best of my knowledge, I've never had a problem with that. And I'll, I'll hold copper then at that level for uh, the latter two weeks, so at least 14 days. If I'm doing a water change in that process, then I'll make sure my, my new water is also dosed up to 1.9 ahead of time and to keep that level strong. Um, after those 14 days up at a therapeutic level, assuming that you know nothing is visible and I've been you know good for, for the latter half of that, then I'll just pull the fish from QT and put it in my tank at that point. Uh, if I started at a lower salinity, something below 35, um, then each time I do a water change, you know, pretty much each week or, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'll stretch to 10 days before I do a water change. Uh, again, depends on ammonia levels, you know, keep a tab on it. Uh, but if it's okay, I'll, I'll give it 10 days before I do a change. But um, I use those water change opportunities to bring up the salt level. I do about three PBT on each water change. That's a pretty safe level to, you know, bump it up every time and not overly stress the fish. And if you do the math, you know, even if it's down here at, uh, at um, you know, like low 20s and your PPT, uh, you'll be up at 35 by the time you get to the end. So hope that was clear, you know, general idea of what I do, not too um, specific. There's flexibility in it. Um, so I hope I made the point that there's a lot of diversity within the Labrids and there's uh, really hundreds of different choices. That's uh, a thing that uh, I get asked sometimes too is, you know, hey, I want RASs, give me a few suggestions. Um, well, I can't really, you know, I, I feel bad sometimes telling people, uh, no, come to me with the list and then we can talk about it. But the reality is I can't pick for you. Um, I don't know what appeals to you. I don't necessarily know what you want to spend. Of course, you could tell me that. But at the same time, uh, the cost of things is relative. You know, even within the U.S., uh, coast to coast, cost can vary. And then certainly around the world, cost can really vary. Um, and then the last thing is, uh, you know, I don't know what you have available. You know, what's available right now in your local market could be really different. Um, you, you could say, I want these species, but the reality is if you can't, you know, buy a couple of them for, you know, a year or two down the road, you know, what you want to pick right now might be different. Uh, enough about that. Okay. Um, need to definitely cover tank. Got to feed it multiple times a day. Berries and flashers are your easiest choices to start with. Your leopards and tamarins are your harder ones. Uh, leave those to later. Most likely avoid cleaners. Um, know what to expect if you want to go that way. Um, pay attention to your genus, your, your Latin names. Uh, be really cautious with common names. Just leave the pseudoclonics races off entirely if you want uh, different different races in a tank. Avoid those. Use that acclimation box and you've got to add new ones. And uh, use your QT. Just always do it. Additional resources, just a few things on here. Uh, if you like books, really the only ones that I like myself, but it's really more of a, just a, uh, a, uh, a field guide for a, an identification database, if you will, are the books by Coiter. The one on the left, uh, Rudy Coiter, he's, he's an Australian guy. On the left, it's pretty easy to get all of the fairy rainbow wrasses. Um, last I checked, been a couple of years, but you could get this one on Amazon pretty readily. The one on the right is a really great book really hard to get a hold of. Um, sometimes Quitter will sell a PDF copy of it. It kind of just depends. I personally have a PDF copy of it. It's also where he starts to change uh, the taxonomy a bit and kind of proposes a new classification for a lot of things. So it can be a little bit confusing if you don't understand what things, uh, what genus things used to be in. Um, hasn't really gotten super, what he proposes in here, hasn't gotten really adopted in the scientific community yet. Maybe it will someday. Um, it's been a while though, so I don't know. Anyhow, Coiter's books are the ones that I personally like. Uh, if I'm going to a website, it's almost always fish base. Um, and to, to drill down to a specific genus and species, you can tap in the names here and uh, you know pull up the page right on that fish. Um, it's my go-to website for pretty much everything if I'm looking for a, a scientific database. I started my own website, it's therasguy.com. I've got all my articles on there to date. Uh, I'll probably add new things in the future. Don't know when. Um, totally open to being contacted via email to uh, rasky at gmail.com. Um, send me questions, uh, pictures for IDs, you know, whatever. I get all that stuff uh, every week. It's great. I, I don't mind. Um, I'll probably get back to you within a day, sometimes within the hour. It just depends on, on when it hits me.
and that's it. So I'd like to thank everybody. Um, it's been great. Love the opportunity. Um, hope it was good for all of you. That was really amazing. Thank you, uh, Hunter. And I think we can give uh, a little bit of time for Q&A. Yeah, perfect. So I'll go down this list first, and then we can go around the room or you know, open table for that, whatever else is not here. Um, so questions posted so far from Wendy. You said no carpet nems or mini carpet nems. Uh, no, mini carpets are OK. Um, they're OK, so think of it this way. Smaller target, right? It's just less apt for a fish to dart into them. Uh, but their sting is also not nearly as potent as a carpet nem is. So your, your mini carpets or your maxi minis, those sorts of things, those, those are okay. Uh, Euro bracing danger. Um, I don't think Euro braces are that much of a danger for jumping fish. Uh, my current acrylic tank has got, you know, an acrylic brace around the top. It's an integral with the tank that's, um, I don't know, about six inches wide all around it. And I have not had that be a problem in itself. Um, I think you're okay there. I've been okay for five years. Are veggies important for overall health? That's a good question. I haven't really seen any great studies for um, nutritional health within Labrids. Uh, I can tell you if I what I haven't done it for a long time, but if I was to feed nori in the tank, pretty much all the wrasses will also eat it. The bits of nori that you'll find like in rods, they, they also gobble that up. Um, is it important? I don't really know, but they will eat it if you give it to them. Is it just a matter of it being seasoned and it smells good, or it's more of a monkey see, monkey do kind of thing with other fish eating it? I, I'm not really sure, but um, I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to feed it. I don't know if it's necessary. Seems like getting a female makes more sense. As long as you're okay to you know, wait for a female to develop into a male and get those you know, bright, bold, saturated colors that you're really after, um, I, I fully agree. And, and yeah, they're typically cheaper. That's how I like to go. Some of them just think I'm really weird when, you know, I approach them and go, you know, hey, do you have a female, a small specimen of this species? I said, why would you want that? Is it really that hard to tell apart some of wrasses when they're young? I don't think it's that hard to tell, especially like within fairy wrasses. I, I've, I've never had a picture of a fairy wrasse that I can't pick apart from another. Um, within flasher wrasses, yes, there are certainly some female flasher wrasses that that I, I'll, I'll raise a question mark on and I'll, I'll openly tell you. Could be one of these, you know, three different species. I don't know yet. It could be any of them. Can't tell at this stage. Um, for, for fairy wrasses, never the case. You can tell them apart. Uh, however, you shouldn't assume that just because it's labeled something, it is. Um, unfortunately, that's something that happens a lot, that things get mixed up at a wholesaler or um, a wholesaler just believes an exporter at face value. You know, an exporter tells them, hey, uh, Oh, you, you want an exquisite wrasse? Yes, I have those, and they sell them, you know, what they label as exquisite, and, you know, it's really filamentosus. It certainly happens. It doesn't happen as much as I used to see it happen about 10 years ago, but it definitely happens. Carpenters instead of the Macoscus. Yeah, so I hope I made it clear on that one slide of, of the flash wrasses. I can flip back to it earlier. That, uh, you know, so these three species, Macoscus, Carpenters, and Yellowfin, can be pretty... Uh, I don't want to say challenging, but are, are certainly a bit trickier to tell apart. And by the untrained eye, it's I can I can it's not hard for me to see one of these species and, and think how someone thinks it's one of the others. Those two are pretty close to another, um, so it's much more common for them to get mixed up. Part of it is you know who are you buying them from? Because typically the suppliers that mix them up um, often are the ones that do it all the time. Uh, so maybe find a different source. Uh, or if you can see the fish before you buy it, then that's always a good thing too. Um, I, I kind of myself prefer, you know, what you see is what you get sales because then there's no question, regardless of what someone calls it, I can look at the picture and go, eh, it's not what you say it is. Um, I think most of the vendors that, that do pictures, that do what you see, what you get sales are generally right. I, I will say the one that I see mix it up most common is NY Aquatics. And I'm not to say that he's the only one that mixes them up, uh, but just from my own observation, and it's not that I'm out there looking at every online vendor by any means. How long do fairy wrasses live? I'm not sure if I missed it. I don't think I talked about that. Um, I, we don't know, <laughs> it's the bottom line. Uh, my own experience, I think about seven to eight maybe up to 10 years, but I think that's about it. Um, other, other genus can live longer. I think the leopards tend to live a bit longer than that. 
Uh, the, the Tamarins or the Anapsis uh, are probably the longest lived. Um, Sanjay, who's it was only the ones, only a handful of people that I know that's been successful with the Lenardi in the long term, and he had a, a very nice terminal male for a while. Uh, I saw I just lost his male, um, I think like last month, pretty pretty recently here, but he had kept that species about 10 years. And um, I don't know how big it was when he got it, but it was certainly still female when he got it and quite a bit smaller. Um, I mean, I, I should ask Sanjay sometime how big that fish was when he when he received it, because uh, that could give us some insight on to how long that particular species and by extension that that genus tends to live. Will a female leopard change to male with another male in the tank? Uh, depends of the same species or different species. If it's of the same species, that's not necessarily going to keep it female. Um, it, it may still transition the male. They're not as prone to doing that as some of the other genus. Um, but that's not to say it can't happen. Um, if they're different species of leopards, uh, then the transitions can be pretty independent of another. Uh, in my own tank, I've got three different leopard species, right? Yeah, technically. Uh, I've, I've got a Potter's, a, a Black or the Australian leopard, and um, a Vivian's leopard. And to date, only the Potter's is male. The other two are still females. The, the Vivian's is not that big yet, so I don't know which way it'll go when it gets bigger. And um, the, the black leopard has, I've kept for uh, about five years now, and it's always been female, and it's pretty good size too. So the potters may be the one keeping it female, but at the same time, I don't see much interaction between the two species uh, almost ever. So I, I, I doubt it. Good answer then, like if I mix different females with different species, will they eventually alter in the male and kill another? So, so, so if they're, I, I wouldn't mix multiple leopards of the same species together if you want to be safest. If you want leopards in the tank, do one of each species. Um, Luca, I have a Cosmetostras and a Cleaner and a 65. I'd like to add a Carpenters and a Lubix. Okay, uh, the Cleaner could maybe be a bit problematic in the 65. It depends. If it's pestering other fish, it might be a bit... Um, not the greatest environment. In terms of the Carpenters and the Lubbocks being compatible with those two, that should be okay. Uh, so the only concern I have there is how your cleaner wants to behave in that size of tank. Bearing that, okay. How long is the transition from juvenile female? Yeah, I, I, I hope, I, I commented on that quickly, but I know I covered a lot fast. Um, it depends, that, that transitional stage from juvie sub male and into terminal male, uh, totally depends. It depends on the age of the fish, which is not always so well known, right? I mean, you know how big the fish is and geese, so you can kind of speculate on how old it may be, but that's not necessarily a one-to-one -one translation either. Um, and then the biggest variable is is the the hierarchy or the dynamics in your tank. That's what really, you know, that, that relationship between interactions is what can really determine how long that transition takes also. Um, it can be, it can be, um, it can be months, it can be years. Um, it's a question I get a lot is how long does that take? And the answer is, is it totally depends and it's completely up to what's happening in your day. Yeah, there are vendors that quarantine out there. I think most of them are, are pretty good and rigorous in what they do. Um, I'm pretty cautionary, and at the end of the day, there's only one quarantine I trust, and, it, and it's it's my own. So even if I buy a fish from a quarantine vendor, I still run it through my own quarantine. Now, what and how I treat with might be very different. You know, I might do very little and just, you know, observationally keep that fish for, you know, six plus weeks. Uh, but I still, you know, I, I still can't buy a fish and just throw it in my tank, even if it comes from a quarantine vendor. I just... That, that's that's with my own personal hang up. You know, you you may be comfortable with that. Melanurus. Okay, so Melanurus is one of those species that is a bit hit and miss on on how aggressive they are towards other fish, and then also how aggressive they are towards your your model inverts. Um, my personal feelings thoughts are Melanurus is is usually pretty mild. Occasionally, some specimens can be pretty aggressive. In terms of how they go after your inverts, uh, it's kind of 50-50 as to whether they're going to really target them a lot or leave them alone. 
the biggest trick with all the halicorus is how much you feed them. The more you feed the tank and the you know, fatter and happier you keep those fish, the less propensity they're going to have to go after the things in your tank that you may not want them to. So there is some risk there, uh, but I, I mean, you really yet to hear of any millineris that's ever been so limiting that someone finds them to be completely uh, incompatible in a reef tank. Um, you may just need to restock your snails more frequently. That's kind of the bottom line. So if you don't want to do that, then yeah. Um, I, I do think troika snails tend to be left alone a bit more than others, just in my experience. I don't know why. I, I think it's it's because the snails are, you know, basically the fleshy part of the snail is pretty much black. And I think the, the darker color like that tends to camouflage them in better and they get left alone. I could be wrong, but that's been my thoughts on that. How long do chorus wrasses live? Okay, okay, all right, time out. Do, do we not have a discussion of, of chorus is, is a, not the best label? Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll glance past the fact that we're calling it a yellow chorus because it's not, it's, it's a halo chorus. Uh, so how long does your canary wrasse live? Your, your, your yellow wrasse live? Um, I don't, I don't know. So if you've got a fish that's around three inches, look at a little bit bigger than that at maturity. I just, from a blanket fashion, would tell you, you've probably got five to six years left with that fish, maybe a little longer, maybe a little less. I, there's not a set time frame, And there's the problem too is, well, how old is the fish currently? Well, we don't really know. You say it's around three inches. I'm, I'm sure it is. I'm not doubting your word, but that doesn't really tell me how old the fish is. It only gives me some general ballpark of how old it might be. Um, Trigger snails are smart. Yeah, there is that part too. And so the, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that, up, brought that up, Jason, because I, I tend to like hermits a lot in my tank. And I also find that most hermits in my tank tend to get pretty nocturnal. I don't see most of them during the day. Uh, but if I look in the tank with the flashlight at night, it's like, wow, I have lots of hermits. I forgot how many I have. Um, if they've wised up because they need to with the fish I keep, eh, maybe. Um, but there's kind of an advantage with hermits too, is hermits have eyes, right? They, they can see things, uh, unlike a snail that uh, has, has rudimentary eyes at best. Um, yeah, but, but trichos can, you're right in the sense that some snails can get a bit more nocturnal also. What else? Is that it? I think that's it. That was one hell of a session. Wow. Thank you so much, Hunter. Uh, that was really fun for everyone. I, I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I did. Uh, I would like to close by uh, thanking Hunter for uh, this wonderful presentation. Thank you for being with us here today. And I would like to thank everybody, all the attendees, uh, for making this uh, happen. So thank you all. And hopefully we'll see you all in the next virtual events. What's your favorite uh, fish outside of wrasses? That's a good um, question. Hmm. I don't know if I really have one. No, I, I do though. You know, there's, there's other fish for sure. Um, candy bass, I think are always super neat. Um, I never appreciated a candy bass until I saw one because the, uh, the stripes on them tend to glow under a tinnix also, and they, they get this iridescence that's really cool. Um, and so it's kind of like, oh, I understand why people now will pay the money for them if they are. Um, gosh, what else do I really like? I mean, I'll, I'll be, okay. I guess the answer to your question is the fish I would totally love to have, but I'm never, ever going to be paying five figures for it, uh, would be a personatus, the genocanthus angel. Uh, love those fish. 